Let's talk about acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, or AIDP. So AIDP is a demyelinating condition affecting the peripheral nervous system, and it's thought to start at the nerve roots. So because it's demyelinating and myelin helps saltatory conduction, then demyelination will stop the saltatory conduction. And the pathogenesis behind the disease is that it's thought that during a preceding infection, the body creates an immune response against both the antigen and something that cross-reacts with peripheral nerve components. So that's called molecular mimicry. Campylobacter jejuni gastroenteritis is the most common pathogen associated with AIDP, although respiratory illness is the most common precipitant overall. For clinical features, it presents as a progressive symmetric weakness that typically begins more distally in the legs and then advances upwards. It can affect the muscles of respiration, the bulbar muscles, and the cranial nerves as it moves upwards. It will reach peak intensity by four weeks. The reason that's important is that because after eight weeks, it's a different diagnosis called chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, and the treatment is a little different. Another hallmark of AIDP is reduced or absent deep tendon reflexes. Because this is a inflammation, there can be back pain, and because if it affects the nerves, there can be paresthesias. There is also dysautonomia that can happen fairly commonly and can be a cause of death, and the symptoms that it can present with include hemodynamic instability, ileus, and urinary retention. So for evaluation, the hallmark diagnostic test will be the lumbar puncture and that will show albuminocytologic dissociation. What that means is that the protein level will be mildly elevated in the sample at 45 to 200, although it can be higher, and the white blood cell count will be either normal or slightly above normal. The lumbar puncture is also more sensitive the later in the course of the disease. So in the first week of symptoms, if you do a lumbar puncture then, up to half of patients may be normal and the lumbar puncture may need to be repeated later on. Another test that can help can be the EMG and nerve conduction studies, and these will also be more sensitive later in the disease, and they will show prolonged or absent F and H reflexes, and those can be the first sign. And they can also show other uh, hallmarks of demyelination, including distal latencies being increased, increased temporal dispersion, conduction block, and reduced recruitment of muscles. The spinal MRI can correspond to the pathology and show thickened and enhanced nerve roots. Now let's illustrate some of these concepts. So in myelinated axons, the action potential can travel quickly down the axon through saltatory conduction. However, when the axon is demyelinated, this conduction is not as efficient, which can result in increased distal latencies. So when you're measuring how long it takes for the action potential to travel down, you can see that there is an increased latency it takes longer to travel down the axon. And if it takes long enough, that can result in a conduction block. Now, AIDP is a patchy demyelination, meaning some neurons are more demyelinated than others. So when you're measuring the compound muscle action potential at the muscle, then you may find that instead of the action potentials all converging at the same time to form the compound muscle action potential, then there may be a wider compound muscle action potential. Now what is reduced recruitment? So whenever you have damage to the nerves, and nerves are upstream of the muscles, so they recruit the muscles. So if you have damage to the nerves, then you won't be able to recruit the muscles to contract. So that's what's called a neurogenic pattern, and that results in reduced recruitment. 
This is opposed to myogenic patterns, which can be seen in myopathies, where because the muscle is damaged, there will be increased recruitment because in order to give the same force, more muscles have to contract. So for management, the ABCs are the most important and specifically you may need to intubate the patient especially if they're displaying shortness of breath at rest, if they're desaturating, if they're using accessory breathing muscles showing signs of impending respiratory failure. The negative inspiratory force can also be used and if it's weaker than negative 30 centimeters of water or if the forced vital capacity is less than 20 mils per kg or if there is a 30% reduction from prior, then those may also be signs that you may need to intubate the patient. So dysautonomia is one of the causes of sudden cardiac death in these patients, and so that may need ICU admission as well if the patient is displaying signs of dysautonomia. The mainstay of treatment is plasma exchange or IVIG, but not corticosteroids, so that is different from the chronic form of this disease. For prognosis, more than half of patients will have a complete recovery and many of the rest will have a partial recovery. However, there is some mortality that can be contributed to the dysautonomias as well as the respiratory failure.